Father, we thank you that we can be here. We just pray for those who couldn't be here and those who are stuck in traffic and what have we. Um, just bless them, help them to connect with um, something tonight, Lord. And I just pray that as we um, gather here, um, that we can know that as we work our way through the, the Bible, Lord, you, you, you're adding to us, you're growing us, you're giving us, um, you're filling us with your spirit and you're giving us um, ability to walk well in you. And um, those of us who are not, Help us to find strength in you, Lord, and know that you are our faithful master who keeps with us through thick and thin. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're in Second Peter. Second Peter, and we're doing chapter 2 tonight. We're going to finish it at chapter 3. Um, what we've got up to now is Peter has sent a second letter. Now, our covering verse is this. Behave yourself. <laughs> I thought it would be 2P2 <laughs> 2P2 <laughs> P2. yeah alright 2P2 um, but with the this is like the covering the way you can teach this a few ways but one I'm, I just wanted to this caught my attention in chapter 3 verse 1 dear friends this is now my second letter to you I have written both of them to, as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and serve you through your, your apostles so next week we'll be on to that and we'll be um, we'll be all over chapter 3 I don't think we will finish it in one week but um, no I don't think we will there's a bit there's quite a bit in there um, but what we want to do is just do a recap on chapter 1 and 2. Peter's gone over the fact that we've been given all that we need to walk this stuff out. But also there's ways where you don't walk it out. There's the corruption of the world. Uh, evil desires can can um, get get hold of you. So basically what it's saying in the beginning of chapter 1 is lean into this. Lean into this grace that you've been given. Lean into this mercy. All the, the And it's divine power. So there's more to the Holy Spirit's filling than than perhaps um, you know like just making you feel good or I'll be with you the paraclete I'll be beside you all that kind of thing but there's more we can draw on in our day to um, help us to walk well and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires it's verse 4 and then um, if you're not doing this you can kind of like you're just blind and, and some people do walk away from all this it's too hard it's on the too hard pile but yet yeah, that's losing your love for Jesus. That's losing your passion to want to see the Lord's work in your life. And we all struggle with that. That can happen from time to time. If you've been around this a couple of decades or more, you're probably just weariness can set in. And sometimes we just have to take drastic measures to really set ourselves back into the grace of God. And to sort of like go, what's happened here? You know, <laughs> what have I let seep into my life? We are like tea bags. Um, we can be we immersed in the water, you know. And uh, the purer that water, the better. And um, but you know we can kind of get also get in waters that, that don't make them just murky waters. The the lusts of this world, the evil desires of this world, even some things that aren't overtly spikes in your life. You know, like things that you go, oh, that's definitely a sin, and that's something I've oh don't don't do that. Did all these kind of stuff. But yeah, just just relaxing into Western living and all that stuff, and it's no one's wagging a finger here, but it's just a case of hey. There was a, we get told about Laodicea and uh, we don't want to be that do we we want to be passionate for the Lord walking it out well and hopefully being a vessel that can be worked through by him into this dark world so that would be the best thing wouldn't it so then there's a reminder um, towards the end of chapter 1 that there's a prophecy of scripture and he's leading us somewhere he's leading us to something and it's going to be about false teachers in the end times and really the key verse there is at the end for prophecy never had its origin the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit and that's really a key for us to know that uh, God does speak through man he does work his way through man but there's also um, earlier on verse 16 we did not follow cleverly invented stories and um, even in his day there were people saying things about the gospel and saying things about God which were inventions and we, what, when we go into this next bit chapter 2 we find out that there's comparisons made in the end times with Noah's day and we talked about Noah and we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah and these two things were themes with Jesus and some of the um, some of the writers of the epistles 
I mean, it was almost word for word. Noah and Solomon Gomorrah seems to be a, um, a combination punch for what the end times will be like. And we teased out last week that um, Noah's day is really rejecting the light. Noah preached for a hundred years while building this big vessel, and nobody except his family dived in. They didn't take the rescue. And today we find that people more and more don't take the rescue. They don't get it. Um, that said, I said to a kid today, I did the gospel thing about, and I said, here's God, and here's the, here's the essence of Christianity. There's a lot, a lot of ways of saying this. And I drew a red line on the board and I said, this is God's standard, this is God's law, and we're all down here, and we can't reach that because of sin. And um, But then along comes Jesus, and he doesn't have that problem because he was born of a virgin. He wasn't of Adam 1's line. And he's there, and he reaches the standard. And if we believe in him, he's reached the standard for us. It's not, it's, that's it. It doesn't get more simple than that. Jesus has reached the standard for us. God looks at Jesus, and if we're believers, he's, you know, we are in Christ. And um, the thing is, is that the, 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 the sins wiped away from us, and he, he chooses to see us as righteous, uh, perfect before him. And uh, don't you think that's incredible? Every time I say it, I'm thinking, is that right? It actually is right. That's the justification. That's the gospel. And um, the more we can kind of marinate in that, um, the better. Um, lost my way now a little bit. Um, so, yeah, so Noah's day is rejecting the light. But Sodom and Gomorrah, if you remember the story, the, um, all, the, um, all the homosexuals went for the, for the angels. That's what was going on in there. And it's really, God is not condemning in, in a sense, the, um, he knows that this this stuff goes on like Homer said. He's not, you know. So this isn't like some pre people have preached it, where it's a condemnation on that, because God knows there's that going on, and He knows that righteousness is going on as well. But it's the widespread acceptance of it which is the big problem, and that's what we'll get today. So Sodom and Gomorrah is embracing the dark, where Noah's day is rejecting the light. So it's a combination punch, rejecting the light and embracing the dark. Can you see that? And that's where we got last week, or the last time we came here. Um, and then it says, goes on to say, um, if this is so, you know, um, Lot got rescued from there. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the, right, the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and those who despise authority. That word there is curiotus and curios is lordship. Okay, so they despise lordship. They don't want a lord in their life. They don't want a king to rule over them. They don't want the king of righteousness to be righteous for them and then try and work it out as best they can. They want to be sinful. They follow the corrupt desire. Tripping up, doing it wrong, getting a season of sin is not following. The, you know, you can get trapped in that stuff and it's thorny and it's awful and you've got to get yourself out of it. But following it willingly is not the way to go. It's not great at all couple of things that we just want to before we carry on with this is if you go to 2 verse um, 1 but there were also false prophets among the people just as there will be false prophet teachers amongst you they will secretly introduce remember alongside parasiago alongside destructive heresies even denying the sovereign lord who bought them now this word here, bought them, is exagorazo, and it's the general buying of all mankind, not the ransom, because that's lutrosis, okay? So they're not talking about saved people here. And I'll try and prove that towards the end of this chapter, that it's first of all talking about people who are not saved, but they're just plain deceivers sent by the enemy to disrupt the church, okay? So just... just um, Keep that in mind that this is exaggerated, so it's just generally talking about the, the Lord's bought these people, but they don't like that, and they haven't so because they don't like that, they won't take the ransom. They know about salvation, but they won't take the ransom. Anyway, starting here, bold and arrogant. These men are not afraid to slander celestial beings, that's 10, 11. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. So there's an absolute blindness about divinity and the divine beings. But these men blaspheme, that speak evil, in matters they do not understand. So we're starting from 12 tonight. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like beasts, they too will perish. And the King James says it better um, in their own corruption. 
So what we've got here, we've got like a, um, a thought. The thinking here is passive judgment. And earlier on again, um, do, 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 bring, it says in verse 1, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And then if you think to yourself, well, what do you mean swift destruction? Well, here's the swift destruction, what happens. When we find ourselves in a situation where we're slipping a bit and we've got sin in our life and it's all going wrong, the grace of God is still active to come and dive into that. He rolls his sleeves up and he gets in on our mess, okay? That's grace and mercy, okay? Every day, I'm sure we're all aware of that. Maybe sometimes more than others. But that must have happened to you at some point where you've had to go to God going, oh, I've got this wrong, <laughs> you know? And um, and then his, his grace and, he, and his rescue is when he, when he rolls his sleeves when he gets involved to rescue again us from these things and to show us grace and mercy and forgiveness and all that but swift destruction comes in the very fact that sometimes he lets go of someone and goes i'm not going to be working with you anymore okay i'm not going to be getting my sleeves rolled up because you're you're going so down a spiral of sin that um you know swift that's the swift destruction you're going deeper and deeper and deeper into darkness. And this is what these people do here. And uh, we'll just read a little bit about what Peter says. And it's quite shocking, the language in the day and age that we live in, where we don't want to be um, politically incorrect. And we don't want to really um, make someone feel bad about something. And we don't want someone to feel um, as if they're being criticised or anything like that. But listen to this. It's, we've already said it, haven't we? They're like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like the, be like the beast, they too will perish. So, I mean, that's strong language, isn't it? And he's talking about the false teachers here. And um, they will be paid back with harm, 13, for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their own pleasures while they feast with you. And the, the word carouse there, I've not heard that word for a long time, and reveling, that's riotously. They're drunkenly. Drunkenly, does it say there? No, doesn't carouse mean to um, drunkenly? Well, it could be, but I mean, I've got the Greek here, and, and the, the, one of the root words there is rioting. It's riotous. You know, it's the, the using... Um, so they're, they're really kind of, there's no abandon with it. It's not like, let's all go over there and go, in, it's actually in front of you. And they're doing it while they feast with you. Now, that's interesting there because um, what that can be said, in their love feasts, that's, the, that's one of the things that's going on there. So another confirmation in the scripture there where they're feasting with you, they're feasting with you believers, okay? They're coming to your house churches, they're coming and having food with you and right in front of you, they're doing all the kind of sinful behaviour. Now, don't forget, it's, we, we can eat, if we think the first century church was like this, um, it was probably lots and lots of people, but also throughput of people. People would be curious. There was a move of God. They would be going into the into the um, house churches, lots and lots of them. And I guess I think there would have been. That's why Paul had to rebuke one, the one the Corinthians because it lacked control. And Paul's saying it's not a place now for absolute abandonment of control There's, you've got to put things in place like people are coming early and eating all the food they're drinking all the wine and all that kind of stuff and this is what it's getting at there's people who are coming there and go carouse it's um, drink alcohol enjoy oneself with others in noisy lively way yep so it's, a, it's got to do with the, 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 the abuse of the alcohol at the house mm -hmm. churches yeah so we don't have alcohol that's we could no one really wants it on that occasion, so but if you do, bring some. It's all good. Um, but I don't think any anyone here will be rioting or carousing or anything like Ray! you know, like and everyone sat there going, "What are we doing here?" And the leaders are probably struggling to get it into, you know, like the elders are probably trying to get some measure of control over it or measure of what's the best word, um, stabilisation. <laughs> Um, so these people are coming in, and then some of them, some of them try to be teachers amongst them, and they, they you know, they, so let's just read them. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. So just note that there, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. So remember when it said, follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature, following it, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. 
Right, so what sort of strong language is being used here? If somebody said that about you, you'd be like up in arms, would you? Mm-hmm. You'd be like, what do you mean? What are you trying to say? It's harsh, isn't it? It's really, it's, well, it's harsh to our ears. Mm-hmm. But here's what happens in um, in the first century. The um, The difference between saved and not saved was a matter of life and death. Don't forget, they'd seen people, well, Jesus particularly, hang on a cross, and others get martyred for this cause. So their heightened sense of we are the elect and these people are coming in to spoil this message is a little bit like having a copy of, and I'm going to use Windows as an example, which really does work well on your computer. And then along comes a virus, but you need it for work. And then the virus is there and you're going, oh, that feeling when you're like, well, now I can't use it, or Photoshop, or it's a long time ago, but what did you used to use um, for the film editing? Um, Vegas. Vegas, Sony Vegas, and all that kind of stuff. You know, if something comes on and then you can't use it, it's like, oh no, that's the disappointment and everything. But this is ten times more because we're talking about life and death, and we're not just that. We're talking about eternal life versus eternal flames. Okay. So the passion here in on this is is times a hundred that we possibly feel because we they're right at ground zero, and really, if we could really think it through and go, do you know what? It really is important that the believers, or people who are not believers, who are entering into all this stuff, are hearing a a message that's full of life and light and not corrupted, that there's no virus involved, and it's pure gospel. Get that? Wouldn't it be (laughs) That That's the ideal, isn't it? But now Peter's rising up and others do it as well. Jesus uh, talked about false teachers, uh, deception actually, four times more than anything else. He talked about it four times more than anything else. Do not be deceived. That's the first thing he said. Tell us about the last days. Do not be deceived. So in the last days, there's going to be deception. And that's what we see today. Lots of deception. Eyes, uh, 14 eyes full of adultery. In other words, they want to see <coughs> the pure union of man and God messed up. They want other things to be involved in it. They want there to be corruption in, the, in, the, in that kind of uh, covenant they never stop sinning they seduce the unstable and they are experts in greed so an expert in greed is somebody who knows what they want and they know how to get it and there's genius in it Okay. so when you look on TV and you see the multi I mean multi hundreds of millions of dollars that they brought in um, to a ministry these are smart people who, who know how to make money and know how to exploit just be aware that this is a last days phenomenon. 15. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Baal. They loved the wages of wickedness, but he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, a beast without speech, who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. And the donkey, without, I mean, this is numbers, if you're taking notes, 22 to 24. We've done this before, it's on the. I think it's on the Revelation um, uh, teachings, chapter 2, I think. Um, the donkey, a, a prophet is supposed to you know, be able to see and speak what he sees and serve in that way. I see it, I speak it, I serve it. Okay? The donkey turns around and saw it, spoke it and served it. So it, in other words, God rebuked to Balaam. Is a donkey that he was riding, an angel stopped in the road. I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I will go on to Revelation 2.14 in a second and just show you something. Um, the donkey stopped and he's going to beat the donkey. And the donkey turned around and said stuff to him. What are you doing? You know, <laughs> And they ah, the donkey, talking donkey. And, um, you know, it just it's a bit of a, when you're a prophet, it's a bit of a, a rebuke to you, isn't it? That the beast that you're um, riding can see, speak and serve better than you can. You know, it's like the ultimate kind of insult. I'm just going to switch over to Revelation 2.14 just to give Jesus' overview of Balaam. Um, So 2.14, Church of Pergamum 12.13.14. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So Balaam, um, he, for profit, so the, not profit as in he's a prophet, but for profit, 
for money, for, for uh, wealth, um, kept being enticed by Balak. And he kept going and prophesying and he couldn't he couldn't get it out. He couldn't curse the Israelites, if you remember the story. And at the end, he did this thing where he enticed them uh, with um, um, sin, basically. And that's how he got them to be corrupted. And that's not great at all. But the root of it all is doing the ministry for, pro for, for profit, for money. Okay, that's what his main sin was. And he, um, he didn't really get away with it. He got killed, actually, in the end. Just quickly to Jude 11. Jude 11. Um, Woe to them, they have followed the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. Okay, so clearly there, Balaam, the sin of Balaam is running for profit. I know people who set off well in ministry, Christian ministry. Um, some I would still call my friends, but I don't think that would be reciprocated. Um where they were really good gifted people and then it became about the ministry and the money okay um, um so that's basically how it goes and even two thousand years ago when this was written it was happening there and it's happened again and we'll find out in next week because i'm going to go into into the prophets and do some thing that it was happening in the old covenant in israel the people forgot what they were all about forgot about god they kind of put a label on saying god follower but actually their only motives was about finances and financial gain. So that's not good, is it? So we've done the Balaam bit there. Um, the donkey saw and spoke and served when it should have been him who was doing it. Um, who feels like a donkey before God sometimes, you know? Because he can use you if you do. <laughs> that's what some people preach. 17. These men are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. So I'm just going to Proverbs 25:14. Just let's have a look at what that says. Proverbs 25, 14. 25, 14. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of gifts he does not give. Right? Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of gifts that he does not give. So basically, you can have. We've had a lot of rain over the last few days. Okay, but you can see that you can see the um, stars there. Right. You can see the clouds are there, you can see the evidence of it, but then the rain doesn't come. But not like Perth over the last few days, where it's been hey, where it's been um, terrible rains and all that kind of thing. But these guys turn up and they're kind of there saying, "Yep, we're the genuine art article." Um, I've been in you know services or conferences where people have turned up and they've got the entourage, the suit, they stand up at the podium, the lights are there, the worship's been on, everyone's been excited about the worship and the message they give is pure and utter garbage okay not scriptural you've been in one as well Which one? No, i won't say it on it <laughs> remember um so then and this person got up and they said this message which was totally unbiblical and it had nothing to do with um what the passage what the, what they were preaching from but it was really bigging up the church they were in and bigging up the minister and saying to everyone serve this man that's what the message was mm. And um, old friend of mine. Ah. Yeah. So um, and it was it was terrible, you know. So really, it's like we'll turn up. It looks like it's got, you know, it's gonna it's gonna be a big rainstorm. And the, rain, the rain's gonna come. The refreshing's gonna come. But actually, nothing comes of it because it's just what well, you you never actually said anything. And I know big names, and there are big names out there who can do a few sound bites. They're probably good communicators, but they never really say anything. You know, they never really change anything with what they say. There's never really anything earth shattering. So they're not doing anything which is kicking against the system. They're not really, you know, the bad system. They're not, they're not, what are they doing? You know, so cloud, uh, was it, there's springs without water, mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is, is reserved for them. What do we think about that? Blackest, darkest, darkness is reserved for them. For their mouth empty boastful words and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. So really, the um, the lustful thing there, by appealing to the lustful desires, is what we long for in a worldly sense. What what the human condition wants in a worldly sense. I'm not going to start listing stuff, but I'm, we know that there's things in our life and in, in the experience of a human being which are ungodly, but yet they are things that pull us away and wickedness and sinfulness. We know about these things. 
But it's not just the things, the spiky things like, oh, that's obviously, it's the things which are rumbling underneath the surface as well. So there's a scripture, I think it's in Timothy, where it talks about um, you, the itching ears, you know, uh, the tickle ears, and they tell you things and it just sounds good and it makes you excited about life. And you, you go, oh, that sounds good, and I'm going to take that and think about it while I eat my Sunday lunch, which is not a problem. We're not having a go at Sunday lunches. But it's just, <laughs> just the whole idea that it's just average rubbish, and they've never said anything. They've never changed a life. They've never spoke. This is why we need to stick to Scripture. We need to stick to what it says and not just go off. Well, you might tell a story here and there and an example, blah, blah, blah. But we've got to expand the Scriptures. That's what it's there for. We don't need anything else but the Scriptures and probably a few people to, to who can articulate it, you know what I mean, so, and there's plenty of resources online we can point you to, but there's plenty of resources online that will also be describing the people here, who are about money, they don't really say anything, they sound good, one guy turned around on a very, very worldwide known ministry and said, I am God Almighty, on the, from the stage. Somebody's, and I'm listening to it going, well, I knew he was an idiot, but I didn't think he'd ever say that out loud, and he did. And now he's the laughing stock of all the critics that he's got, so mm -hmm. quite deservedly, as I drink my, what is it, apple juice? Sell off. Um, for the mouth, empty boastful words, and appealing to the lustful desire of the sinful human nature. So the, the, the uh, speaking into that, the, the, they're not giving you light. They're not giving you life. They're not giving you scripture. They're actually drawing you to look at the things that you, the base elements of a human being wants anyway. Greed, through money, um, possessions, through fame, through ego. All them kind of things. Just speaking into that. Never really saying anything which is going to be changing to the human heart. And don't forget, the, the one of the pre, the pre-verses to this is... For prophecy, let's just read it again. For prophecy never had its origin the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now prophecy then was prediction and fulfilment and actually pattern, but I won't get into that time. But prophecy now is not that. There's no prophets in that way anymore because the thing's fulfilled. There's a full stop at the end of it. So prophecy now is bringing out the word of God and proclaiming it loud and proud to the to the thing. So, you, so if I say to you, Jesus Christ is Lord, we all need to bow, bow our uh, knees to Jesus and we need to do it now, it's prophetic. Why? Because I'm normally proclaiming what's going on anyway. Before it hadn't happened, Messiah hadn't come, we haven't got the apostles, so it was partial. So they had to pr predict through pattern and fulfilment. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. The prophets of the old covenant... They predicted what would happen in the new covenant because in time they're back here somewhere so it hasn't happened yet so they had to tell the people at the time that Messiah's coming and they had to say the nature of that coming and they had to say the nature of the problems that would be found in the nation during that coming so don't listen to false prophets listen to the prophets and we'll talk about that next week but um so when they were prophesying we don't need oh, as time took its toll we don't need that kind of prophecy anymore John the Baptist was the last one. It says it in Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Okay. But then we move on to a small p kind of prophet prophecy when we only proclaim what's already been written. So we're, we're prophesying the word of God when we, when we speak it out. And um, there is a sp specific d gift of prophecy. When I, when I, if, if somebody would, in a, in a church meeting or, you know, when you're praying or something, just go. And there's a couple, you do it a lot. You don't know you do, but you do. And um, and you kind of go from praying to sort of like saying something. So it goes from there to there. And then it kind of switches. And um, others do it a lot in here as well. Um, and it starts to say something profound about the word of God for that moment in that time for this person or these people. Do you know what I mean? Can you see the difference? You're only saying what's there, but it's a, now it's a matter of timing and the Holy Spirit's um, issuing forth at that moment for a gift to a person or a group. Did you see the difference? I'll do a teaching on that, a full teaching on that at some point, because you might not know what I'm talking about. 19. All right, let's do 18 again, because it fits into 19. For they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, 
while themselves are slaves of depravity, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. Right. So, there's a promise of freedom, but they're doing all the stuff which they're talking about. And um, they've been mastered by it. You, they've been around sin so long that it's second nature. They'd probably just got a seared conscience, not even questioning it. But why would they? Because my... And I'd like I'll be challenged on this that I think that's talking about non-believers, and the reason I think that is because of the next few verses, because then he says, twenty, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by not knowing our Lord Jesus and Savior Jesus Christ, so that's kind of saying the last lot was not believers, but now he's saying but if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And are again entangled in it and overcome. Notice that word in there. You can be entangled in the corruption again. Okay? And you can be overcome by it. You can be you can find yourself in a worse position, and it says it here. Um and entang and again entangled in it and overcome. They are worse at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on him, the sacred command that was passed on to them. What's the sacred command? Repent and be saved. Okay. Of them the proverbs are true, the dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. So, a tale of two persons really, I think, I think it is. The, the first bit where it's extremely harsh, you know, and the warning there is to say, this is the the force of the of the language that's going to be used about these people who are part of your, your church and the kind of teaching people and enticing people off and it wouldn't be in the church meeting where you'd find people going oh guess what you know we can go out after you know a bit of cocaine and all that stuff you know get a bit of you know a bit what you know pick someone up you this that's not where it takes place it takes place in social areas afterwards can I come round to your house for dinner? Yeah, and the, per the new Christian or the person who's just learning the ropes. Yeah, of course, great, I feel honoured. You know, so the person comes round to your house and the subject, you know, is subtly, like I said before, truth and then error at the side of it. You see, and this this is a thing that happens in the early church and it's been happening ever since. Now we see examples of the development of that, of the very developed um, stages of these things. Where we find mega churches, and not all mega churches are victim to this. It's just a lot are. Uh, the reason why they become mega churches is because they want to be mega, mega finance, mega attendance, mega world stage, mega profile for the people involved, mega fame, mega, mega. I think is what I'm trying to say. But that's why they're called mega churches, and the aspiration for a lot of them is to 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 move into TV ministry and to have like some people have got like four and five jets and then when asked why they've got four and five jets because obviously that's a bit lavish um, I mean one's a bit lavish really they say oh I couldn't do my ministry if I didn't have this jet I couldn't get to these places well legit I don't know I don't know does God need a jet or could he raise people up in the vicinity of the city that you have to go to in your jet to win those people for the lost if it was rigged biblically and that's the challenge. Does it take one about you know, five, you know, multi? Probably one says he's a billionaire to go around America and just go to city to city. Is that how it works? Is that what we see here? No. no. So um, there's clear problems there. Any questions about that? There's um, there's a lot in there. It's well. Chapter two is one of the. <laughs> Like I said, Dr. Martin Lord Jones says it's the biggest nightmare in the New Testament, that chapter. Um, so you've got to pick the bones out of it. We could exegete it more, we could spend six months on it. But we're not going to because we talk a lot about the dual nature of man. We talk a lot about our propensity to lean towards sin, but God says, no, I'll live by the Spirit. And then we can have lots of victory if we're successful in that. Uh, we keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. If we you know, anchor ourselves into the Lord... If we keep ourselves, um, yeah, all those things, um, we we will probably be doing well. And that starts with chapter, chapter one. So next week we're going to go on to chapter three.
and I'm going to do, um, it might be a bit of a special week where we look at some prophecies and I want to show you from the old prophets where specific things are to do with talking about today. Prophecy works like this, it, um, um, they prophesied for their own time for the first coming of Jesus and for the second coming of Jesus. Now we're in second coming of Jesus territory. So the prophecies that they prophesied, the, pro the prophets uh, were valid for today. Um, because Jewish prophecy works from pattern and prediction and fulfillment where us Gentiles have um, sometimes just narrowed it down to uh, prophecy and prediction if you say it, it'll happen but with the Jews' mind it's not like that and the Jews, <coughs> the Jews wrote this so we have to take note alright um, Definitely no questions about that. Anyone concerned about the force of the language that's used against these false teachers in a world where everything's politically correct and you're not allowed to offend anyone? Okay. Just I'm disturbed by it. <laughs> I get a, what does other people's written Bible by, by, by say about um, a man that's given over to his sins? Uh, two seconds. Uh, nineteen. 19. Mm. Well, mine, mine's a NIV. Yeah. Um, and that reads: They promise them freedom while they set themselves as slaves of depravity. But people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Yeah, okay. Because the Greek says man as well, but it's been changed to people. Mm. Weird. Anyway, I was just wondering if it was a recent update or for the other NIV. Um, NIV got, uh, can't remember when it got updated, but it got updated to gender neutral language. I've got the 1984 version, which didn't. Yeah, the Mine says people. You better sticking around uh, King James and old NIV, New American Standard Version, probably International Standard Version, New Living Translation sometimes. It's dynamic equivalence. You've got to find out which is saying it better word for word. Yeah. Because the more you get like messaging and passion translation, you um, it's, it's slightly problematic, extremely problematic really. So Sometimes, yeah. Um, just to comment on that, slaves of depravity. In other words, you can not stop sinning. It says it up there. They never stop sinning. Slave to depravity, they can't. They haven't got the wherewithal. This is why I think these are non-Christians. The 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 um. The components that we need, the filling of the Holy Spirit and the wanting to walk well with God is the thing that puts us on the straight and narrow. But if you haven't got those things, then you're not saved and you can't do anything but sin. You'll just walk straight into it. You've got no defence. Here it says, Charles Spurgeon says, I believe that the most damnable thing a man can do is to preach the gospel, the gospel merely as an actor and turn uh, the worship of God into a kind of Theatrical performance. So it's, mm. it's funny the word hypocrite comes from a, a Greek word Hippocrates which is like the um, the idea of having dual faces like you've got one face or one thing like two faceness or a double act you know you're doing one thing but saying um, another, saying another yeah. Yeah. Um, and we all we, you know we can all um, yeah you know, if you if you do preach the gospel or talk any, you know, you can immediately the devil's great at saying, ah, but what about you? You've got this going on. You're struggling with this. Yeah, we're not talking about struggles and stuff. We're talking about following evil desires, never stop sinning, slaves to depravity. You know, yet they're still trying to teach people, and it's pure evil. And that's why Peter's going, not on my shift. That's why John's not on my shift. Jude, not on my shift. Jesus, not on my shift. It's not going to happen. And they had to fiercely protect it in their day. But today, I'm not talking about anyone in this room, but sometimes we're not harsh enough on the false teachers that are around. Sometimes we're not down the line enough. And I think it's just, I think, I think we think that it doesn't touch us. You know, it's not touching me, why should I bother? You know? But, where, but I've got a jealousy for those, I don't know whether it's a calling or something, but a jealousy for those who I don't even know they were turning on the God channel and seeing garbage in their ears every night. And I'm like going, because it's TV, they think it's right. Because it says the God channel, they think it's right. The, um, the people who started the God channel split up. He had an affair with someone, ran off with someone. The, um, <laughs> so, 
doesn't mean everything's wrong what's on there. Some of my favourite preachers a while ago were on there. A couple of them are dead now. But um, but yeah, we've just got to be really careful what goes in here. And um, for all the talking about false teachers, I can give you green lights on loads of people that it would take you all your life to listen to, with a few cautions here and there. You know, so there's no point in just going, oh, the world's full of false teachers. It's not. There's loads of resources you can get, but it's truth and error on the other side. You can watch one program on the God Channel, and then the next one's false teaching, then the next one, and it's always, you know, 60% of it's true. You're the great preachers, some of them. I'm like, going, this is awesome. And then some of them go, oh, I just said that, and that's not true about Jesus. Um, could you put a list of those people in the hundreds chat? Yeah, I'd rather tell you about them because um, I, I will do that. And, and But there's, there's some of them where, I'll give you an, an example. No, I won't give you an example on this, but... My, my thing is, is that if you verbally tell me, I won't remember. Yeah, I can do that. I can yeah, put some on there. Uh, but I, there's some that... There's some. There's even a guy who's like a mid-trib guy, and he's really fiercely mid-trib. And he has, a, he has a go, eh? Hey? Chandler? No, I won't listen to Chandler. I'll only listen to him a little tiny bit. Here. Oh, you used to. He just preached on Revelation. He was rubbish. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. So, um, and then... So there's one guy, he's mid-trib, and he has a go at pre-tribbers, which I'm a kind of pre-tribber at the moment, no one's persuaded me any other way, so, but I still listen to him, because his other stuff's like, great, it's like fillet steak, it's great. Who's this? Hey? Who's this? I won't say it on here. Ah, okay. Because if someone listens to this, people get polarised, because they're like, oh, you listen to that person, I'm not listening to you, and that's what people do. So, isn't that a lot of fun? <laughs> and people might, people might, you know, you might hear, oh, whatever we've got on YouTube, what Gary's preaching and stuff like that oh I'm not a mid-tribber he's a false teacher right and fine but but I'd rather have a conversation with him and just say hey instead of just labeling me I'm a sort of person you just say do you remember me saying a few years ago we present a model of things we only present models and, we'll, and when we do like Romans or Revelation we'll say this is why we talk about this this way and hopefully we can put enough evidence together to say hey we present this to you like this so dogmatism doesn't really come into it. I mean, obviously there's things like the resurrection. He definitely did, right? <laughs> You're not a Christian. There's no salvation if he didn't. You know, and the, um, he died for your sins, uh, justification by faith, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can't really, there's no wriggle room. It just is what it is. But when it comes to grey areas, I don't even think the grey areas, but some people do. I'm happy to just discuss it, you know, and say, hey, all right, down with the labour, you know, lower your font, and let's have a talk about it. <laughs> Let's pray. I'll pray. Father, we thank you for this, and we are a bit shocked by the tone of Peter here, uh, because, but I think that's how he is today, and that's our conditioning today, and the way we are with, um, we've been, mm, have we been watered down a little bit? I don't know. But if we have, Lord, I just pray for a refreshing, a renewal of your mind. Um, um, we can stimulate us to wholesome thinking, Lord, we do want to recall the words of the prophets of the past and um, also the um, the freshness of the uh, apostolic anointing that you gave for this word that we've just read now. Help us to have this imbibe into our spirit. Um, give us a heart transplant, Lord, and renew our minds in Jesus' name. Amen.